Hit number 193. <laughs> that sounds familiar. sermon this morning, so it's a good place to pick up. Thank you, Lord, for leading us. Lord, I pray this will be the day that we, God, enter the realms of day. God, thank you for this life down here. Help us to serve you. Help us to win people to Christ. Come back and get us soon, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Oh, maybe. 309 in the Burgundy. Man of Sorrows, what a name. Sunday night, oh, forget it. Too much preaching and teaching. Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. And we're going to look at just one verse. Now, I, I'm, I'm going to preach more than one verse next week, but um, it, this verse particularly struck me when I was looking through the book of Romans, uh, thinking about what I was going to preach. I want you to look at what Paul said there in verse number one. And, and I, want, I want you to think about it uh, and contemplate it for a minute. 
he says brethren. So he's talking to us. Okay? He's talking to all the brethren. Particularly those that are Rome. My heart's desire and prayer to God. So this is what he prays about all the time. For Israel is that they might be saved. I want you to think about that. We're going to look at that tonight. Um, Paul was a soul winner. But he had a special desire for his kinsmen, uh, the Jews. And being of the tribe of Benjamin, um, and being raised under Gamaliel, uh, he knew a lot about the Jews' religion. Um, he practiced it before he got saved, very scrupulously, uh, even to the uh, uh, execution of people who did not believe. Um, and when he got saved, a strange transformation happened. Paul got a burden for his own people. Yet, that's not the people that God called him to. Yet, every chance he got, he witnessed to the Jewish people. When he went into a new town, he didn't go to Bob's Burger Joint or Suzanne's Ice Cream Sand and... Or, or the local pagan temple, he went down to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. And he stood up, and he read the scriptures, and he preached to them Christ. And he had a desire. Paul was a soul winner. Uh, now, let me say this by way of introduction. Uh, there are some that try to teach methods on how to soul win. And you do need to plan when you go soul winning. And if you've never come up with a plan personally, uh, you need to sit down one day and when you got some time to think and say, okay, what would I say to someone if I wanted to lead them to Christ? And make your own little plan. Everybody needs their own little plan. Brother Bill had a plan. I tried to copy Brother Bill's plan, but frankly, I, I use my own plan now. Because through the years, I found that I'm me and he was he, him. And, and uh, I got my own plan. So get your own plan. But you can read these books and listen to the tapes and DVDs on soul winning. It won't hurt you to see what other people have to say. Uh, but beware of salesmanship. Soul winning is not salesmanship. And there's a lot of people that teach basically salesmanship in place of soul winning. Um, some try to emotionally stir up believers to go out and win people to Christ. And there's nothing wrong with being emotional about wanting to see people saved. It doesn't hurt to be emotional. It doesn't hurt to have uh, an emotional burden. But, you know, emotions will only carry you so far. And eventually emotions will go away or wane or uh, come and go. And thus, if that's all your motivation for winning souls is, you're not going to be very efficient at it. Or else you're not going to do it for very long. Some try guilt. They sit there and they try to guilt their congregation and go winning souls. Um, I call this, there's, there's a couple kinds. Uh, uh, one of the most famous kind is, I won 350 people to Christ today. How many did you win? I oh, know you didn't. That's just, you know, I, I just don't believe stuff like that no more. Look, you don't have to win people over to Christ out of guilt, out of emotions, out of just plain method. It should come from a deeper place. And in this one little verse here, God lays out for us how to be a soul winner. Just one little verse. Is all. God's stuff is, like I told you this morning, God's stuff is simple. So, let's look at a few things about soul winning. Three things I want to point out about the Apostle Paul. First of all, he says here, if he's an example for us, that soul winning has to do with your desire. Now, See, that's an emotion, desire. And you need to have a desire to win souls. But your emotion uh, doesn't need to be totally based on emotion. Uh, flip, flip the page over to chapter 9. And we've read this before, but we're going to read it again. Matter of fact, we're going to come back to this little passage of Scripture a couple times tonight. This is the first one. He said this in chapter 9, verse 1 through 3. I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart, for I wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. Okay? 
Now, I want to know several things in chapter 9, 1 through 3. First of all, this desire Paul had that he expressed in chapter 10, verse 1, was based on truth. Notice he says, says, I say in truth, in Christ. Your desire needs to be based on the truth. When you get a, a nudge from God to win souls, God will give you something from the Bible to help you along. When God calls people to preach under the ministry, he gives them verses of scripture to help them get called to preach. When God sends soul winners, he, when God calls missionaries, when God does anything with you, Christian, it needs to be based on the book. And God will give you some uh, souls. There's a, uh, a verse, uh, we read this the other day in, in Psalm, you don't have to turn there. I'm just going to remind myself. At Psalm 2, there was a, a great missionary uh, they got down on his knees, and uh, this is what he claimed. And this verse has nothing to do with missions. But, but it, it, it says this. Um, it, it says, uh, let me get down here to it. Um, Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance. He claimed that verse for his mission work and his soul winning work. You know, you, you can do stuff like that. It, it doesn't doctrinally apply to you. But sure, you can take that verse and run with it if you want to. You can use one of these verses. Uh, it's based on truth. So get your verse of scripture. Uh, it's also based on your conscience. Now, this is tough on people. It says there in 9.1, my conscience also bearing me witness. Um, people that have burned their conscience up and burned them out, that, it's tough on them. Because they have no conscience as far as uh, people's souls are concerned. When you look at folks and you see them, um, you ought to see more than just their outside. Uh, and this is hard. Uh, men, this is summertime, Pensacola. I don't have to remind you this. It's tough, isn't it? Because uh, a lot of these young ladies run around town and they don't put much clothes on. And it's hard to look at a person like that and see a soul. Because you're too busy avoiding looking at their lack of clothes. But you got to look at them as souls. And some dirty, grungy old guy that smells, you got to get past that smell and look at him as a soul. And that person you deal with in your business that aggravates you so bad, you've got to get past that and you've got to look at a soul. And that comes from down here, that, that soul vision. And then, it's, then you've got to have a burden. You've got to have a burden. Paul said, I have a, con a great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. Uh, in, in chapter 10, verse 1, he said, my heart's desire. Do you have a burden for someone to see their safe? Now, this morning, we had a sermon about a good woman and a bad woman. And we had someone raise their hand and say, pray, pray for this person and pray for... They got a burden for somebody in their family to get right with God. There's nothing wrong with that at all. Uh, matter of fact, their lost condition ought to bother you a lot. You say, well, I don't know how to talk to them. And i, and I got to say this. People in your family are the hardest people to talk to for, about the Lord. Why? Because they know you. <laughs> they, 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 you know, they may have known you when you was a bad little kid or, or uh, you know, when you had, uh, uh, you know, spaghetti drool on your face when you was in a high chair. You know, it's hard to witness to people like that. But you've got to make yourself. you got to have a burden for them. And there's nothing wrong with that, uh, having a burden. Uh, in uh, Detroit, Michigan, uh, there was a fellow that uh, had spoken on soul winning, this preacher, and he urged the people uh, to tell who it was that they loved and that they ought to win, but had not won yet. So after his service, he had a testimonial service. And uh, somebody mentioned a sister, another one a brother, uh, another one, a neighbor, uh, another one mentioned their son. Uh, one preacher, a college graduate, a noble, sound young man stood, and he said very earnestly, it is my father. He said, the problem is he is the best man I ever knew. I never know, knew him to tell a lie. He, he does not owe anybody. He will not owe a debt. Uh, he raised me very strictly. He was always a good man. I was always timid in pressing him about the matter of salvation. But after hearing you preach tonight, I know I must and I will. Pray for me. So he left the service, this young man. And he drove 40 miles 
north of Lansing, Michigan, to see his unsaved father. And he woke the family up out of bed in the middle of the night. And he got his father out of bed, and his father said, Well, huh, why, son, don't you believe that I'm a good man? And the son said, Oh, yes, Dad, but you need to be born again. You need a new heart. Your heart is not, is not good until it's changed by letting Jesus come in and trust Him. And then fervently entreating his father with the scriptures and with his testimony, the lad labored till 1.30 in the morning. And finally his dad relented, bowed his head and received Christ as his Savior. At 1.45 or 1.50, the preacher that preached the message got a phone call. <laughs> and he woke up and said, yeah. he said, Oh yeah, I remember. Yeah, you got that one. He said, I want my dad to cry. And they had a little, little shout. Look, you have to work at people and work at people and work at people and work at people. But eventually, with enough prayer and enough witnessing to them, you may have to witness to them till they won't listen anymore and then take a break and just pray. Eventually, God will break down that soul and you'll get in or somebody else. And look, if somebody else wins them to Christ, you better shout and say hallelujah. Your desire tonight, your desire will make you into a soul winner. And not only that, your prayer life will. He said in chapter 10, verse 1, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is. This is what he prayed about in his prayer life. That the Israelites would be saved. Now Paul was a young man. Uh, he was probably under the feet of Gamaliel when Jesus walked the land. And uh, he might have been, uh, maybe he was a little younger at the time. Uh, I'm sure he heard of Jesus. I'm sure he knew the miracles that Jesus did. Uh, most everybody in Judea. Jesus made a big splash all over the world at that time. So, uh, he knew that Israel had rejected their Messiah. And I'm sure this grieved him because he had received Jesus as his Savior and his Messiah. And, and he knew the wonderful things that were in Christ. And uh, uh, he wrote all about them. And, and yet he would talk to his brethren, and he, he talked to them about a passage where, you know, there was a veil in front of their eyes. And, and that stuff broke his heart. So he'd get down and he'd pray. Now, what do you pray for? What, what, if you want to be a soul winner, what do you pray for? Well, look at Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Let's look and see what a soul winner prays about. Now, Ephesians chapter 6 is well known. It's where the whole armor of God is. And in chapters uh, 6, uh, verses 10, all the way down to 17, it talks about all the parts of the armor. And I won't stand here tonight and preach the parts of the armor. But in verse 17, you end up with a sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Uh, what's the piece of punctuation after that? Word God in chapter uh, verse seventeen. Anybody see? It's a colon. It's not a period, is it? So the thought goes on. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints and for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. So Paul says, look, pray for me that I may be bold. So, if you're going to pray for yourself, pray God will give you some boldness. You say, I'm timid. Yeah, but there's got to be a way you can win people to Christ, even though you're timid. I've known pe timid people to do all kinds of things. Uh, I think that's why tracks were invented, for, for basically timid people. Uh, I finally got me a, a YouTube card. I've been telling people to write, I've been writing down the YouTube address for people and hand it to them on scraps of paper. And I finally made me, uh, uh, if you want some of these, I'll, I'll make you some of these. On the back, I just put uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 4. Uh, for I delivered unto you, first of all, that which is received, how the 
uh, that Christ died for our sins according to scriptures, and he was buried, and then he rose again the third day according to scriptures. Then in the front, I just have my name, the church address, and the YouTube channel. And uh, that that's a gospel track. It's a very simple one. Then I've got my little business cards with my little plan of salvation. I carry tracks with me. I carry gospels of John in the car. And I pray God will give me boldness. The longer you do, uh, it is between sessions that when you tell people about Christ, the more boldness you're going to need to get started. Uh, in uh, soul winning class, we used to call this cold feet. If you wait too long, you start to get cold feet. And you need to pray about your cold feet. Pray for boldness. That you just open your mouth and let her fly. Look, what's the worst that can happen? They say no. You go away. Talk to somebody else. And then not only do you pray for boldness, look at Colossians. Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4. Look at verse number 2. Colossians 4, 2. Second thing you need to pray in your prayer life if you're going to be a soul winner. The Bible says in a chapter of Colossians 4, 2, continue in prayer. Well, keep up praying. That's good. And watch in the same with thanksgiving. So be thankful. With all praying also for us that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in bonds. Paul says, pray that God will give me an open door. Well, you can pray about your own open door too. Pray for open doors. So what's an open door? Well, you go to someone and they say, don't bother me. Eh, go away, go away. That's a closed door. But an open door is uh, you go up to them and say, you know, I'd really like to talk to you about Jesus. And they say, well, okay, sit down. That's an open door. Now, sometimes the door is cracked and you have to nudge it open. I know people that stick their foot in the door. But really, truly, God can open doors for you. Uh, when John Thompson wanted to win millionaires to Christ, um, he prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. Uh, he got him a good suit. He got him a leather briefcase. Um, he got him a nice Bible. He put his suit on, polished his shoes up. Uh, went up to the corporate tower up at some oil company, uh, made an appointment with the head poncho up there. Uh, they led him into the appointment. He put his briefcase on the desk, sat down and said, uh, well, Mr. So-and-so, I'm here to talk to you about Jesus Christ. And the guy couldn't back out. He'd made an appointment. And he won that person to Christ, that big oil magnet. Uh, he did that all the time. Um, he used to go to the cocktail parties and drink ginger ale and witness to the people in the cocktail parties. Now, not everybody can do that. But he prayed God gave him open doors. And God gave him open doors. And when God opened doors, he walked through it. So pray for open doors. Dr. J.L. Ward, president of Decatur College in Decatur, Texas, uh, when, uh, when John R. Rice went there, uh, told John R. Rice that he had been a roommate of uh, George W. Truett, which was a famous preacher at Baylor University. And uh, he, he often went to visit with Dr. Truett when he, they were students together. Uh, and believe me, sometimes when these famous men of God were, were students, they, did, they weren't like when they were famous men of God. They had a little bit more. I, I, I've done some of that myself. Amen. He told me how the one time he had gone to visit with Dr. Truett from the First Baptist Church, uh, they had went out to lunch. Uh, they crossed Acknard Street uh, with its sidewalks filled with people at noon rushing hither and yonder and cars in the streets everywhere. And they stopped at a corner and Dr. Tru Truett stood and he said oblivious to the changing traffic lights and he gazed at the people. And at last he turned to me with quivering lip and tear running down his cheek said, Ward, look at them, Ward. They're lost. Look at that crowd. They're lost. They're lost. Now, Dr. Truett didn't need much of an open door. So it's all, 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 all what you pray for. And you know what the last thing you need to pray for is? Now, now both these passages of Scripture, uh, Colossians 4.3 says, uh, uh, 
verse number four, let's keep reading four, says that I might make manifest as I ought to speak. And, and back there in Ephesians, he talked about saying what he needed to say, being made manifest. Look, there's nothing wrong with getting down on your knees with the scriptures and with God and saying, God, help me to say the right things when I have the chance. Because we're only human. And sometimes we need guidance on what to say. Let me ask you, the first time you sold a car, did, did, did it go real smooth? Did you know what to say? You, you probably said all kinds of things you shouldn't have said. Uh, I, I, I remember the first time I got up to preach. I made a hash of it. Uh, but you know, that happens. Um, you have to learn what to say and you have to pray about those things. You have to say, God, show me what to say. Um, I remember the first time I gave the slideshow uh, out in the church somewhere that Brother Bill wasn't sitting there. I, I probably made a mess of that thing. But after a while, I get so used to it, I can just rattle it off. And that's a bad thing right there. Sometimes you need to go back and reset your talk because you get too used to saying what you say it out of rote, not out of the burden of your heart. So you need to pray about those things. Your prayer life needs to be very specific. And then finally, if you're going to be a soul winner... You think you shouldn't have to say this, but you need to put a little effort into it. <laughs> Some people say, I'm going to be a soul winner. Yeah, well, you never go visiting. You never speak to anybody. You know, you got to talk to people before you win them to Christ. Amen? you gotta, you got to make an effort. And according to Romans chapter 9, verses 1 through 3 that we just read, uh, I mean... You get the idea, verse 4, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption. Um, he, he says, I wish that myself were cursed from Christ for my brethren's sake. Uh, nobody ever said it would be easy to win people to Christ. I worked on a guy for 10 years. I worked on my sister for 13 years. So you just have to get in there and you have to grub and grub and grub and, and hoe and water and plant and chase critters away and eventually you'll get something to sprout and you'll get some fruit and nobody said it would be easy now I saw this the other day and then I saw a little bunch of ladies on public TV and they were sitting around reading the same list that I'd pulled off the internet they said you gotta work at it this is a list of terms that people use as slang young people in 2020 does anybody know what the word extra means? It's a verb. It means to be unnecessarily dramatic or over the top. <laughs> extra. You're extra. Period with a T at the end. Period. It's a noun. Anybody know what that means? Now this is a, this is a takeoff on what we say. We say, and such and such and such, Period. Well, they picked up on that, and they've emphasized it. That means a special emphasis at the end of a sentence, usually used with the phrase, and that's on, period. In other words, to say something, 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 and, and that's on, like it's going to happen, period. All right? Snatch. Does anybody know what that means? Snatch. It's an adjective. It refers to the fashionable attire or used to further insult uh, to someone who you believe has lost an argument. So, if someone is dressed really lousily, they're snatched. And if they've lost an argument, they're snatched. And you can insult them by saying that to them. You never know this. And you've got a witness to these people. Wig. Does anybody know what that means? Wig. I'll give you a few of these. These are, these are fun. I, I, wig is an exclamation refers to the idea that it was so amazing it blew your wig off. <laughs> that thing is funny. All right, here's one. Young people say, big yikes. And I've heard this one in the store. Big yikes. Well, it's a more emphasized version of yikes. <laughs> that comes from cartoons. Yeah. All right, fit. Anybody know what fit means? Fit. It's a noun, it's, it's a, um, and, and it can mean an outfit or a clothes you wear. That's in Britain. Over here, 
It can mean attractive. Attractive, if you're attractive. Bet. Now, this is one you ought to know. Bet. It's just they short. They short I, I'll say, you bet you, or you want to bet? They shorten it just to the word bet. It means, yeah, okay, we'll see. Okay? Fire. What does fire mean? The word fire. It means being really cool or amazing. All right, here's one. Cap or no cap? The cap is to tell the truth. No cap is not to tell the truth. Don't ask. I guess it means capitals, capitalized left. Now, you say, why are you showing you? Because sometimes you've got, you got to do a little research to talk to people. The older you get, especially. Uh, if you, anybody wants a copy of this stuff. Uh, oh, here's one. Salty. What does salty mean? I thought this was kind of funny. Salty. Salty means to be annoyed, upset, bitter about something very minor. Salty. Uh, let me see. When they say slay, it's a verb. What does that mean? To su succeed. You slayed it. Here's one. Oh, this is a good one. T. T is a verb. What does T mean? They say T. T-E-A. T. -E -A, T. It means to gossip, like a bunch of old biddies sitting around drinking tea. <laughs> or spilling of the tea, which is a British phrase. Or you said it. All right, if a person is thirsty, what is the young people telling you about that person? It's an adjective. It means the person referred to is overly eager or desperate for attention or approval or a compliment. They're thirsty. So... You gotta try hard. About every ten years, I do one of these. Cause let's face it, Brother Jeff has never been the height of cool to begin with. I wasn't cool in my generation. I'm certainly not gonna be cool in this generation. But I'd like to know what they're talking to me about if I have to talk to them. Man, interesting. All right. I guess I'm weird. I think stuff like that is kind of funny. Romans chapter 11, your effort, your effort, Let, let's, let's, nobody said it would be easy. Verse 13, Romans eleven thirteen. 13. For I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am an apostle of the Gentiles. I magnify my office. If by any means, now look at there, if by any means I may provoke to emulation them that are, are my flesh and might save some of them. What's Paul saying there? He's saying, I'm willing to do whatever it takes to win my brethren to Christ. He even got in trouble with God and went to, went to Jerusalem when God told him not to go to Jerusalem. He was willing to do whatever, and I'm not talking, I'm not telling you get in trouble with God to win somebody to Christ. But are you willing to do what it takes to win somebody to Christ? That's your effort, your desire, your prayer, and your effort. In conclusion, I want to encourage you to uh, let God use you, to yield to the Holy Spirit of God. And pray while God uses you. Usually when we go soul winning at this church, we take two people. One praise and one witnesses. And that's a good plan. But no matter how you go, I want to say, go! Go! One night a man named Holland Yates preached. And he had only had a fifth grade education, Brother Oates did. And he butchered the king's English. He told how he had worked a hard and as a stonemason and had brought a stone yard and how he drank and cursed with the fellows. And, and then one day, God got a hold of his heart and God saved him. After he got saved, Brother Yotes uh, 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 told that how he began to do personal work uh, the best that he could. Uh, and one day, uh, he, he dropped a big stone on one of his feet and smashed his uh, big toe pretty bad. And he went to his office and shut the door and prayed. And said, Lord, 
Now, if you're trying to tell me something, go ahead. You've got my attention. <laughs> if there's anything you want me to do, uh, I have. Uh, you can have my boy. Uh, God, I've, I've told you, you can have him for your service. Do you want me? You can. I don't have much of an education, but if you want me, you can have me. If you want me to sell my business, I'll go and sell. Go to preaching, fifth grade education now, and just an old stone mason. And he unlocked the door. And as he unlocked the door, a man came in. And he looked up at the man and said, would you like to buy a stone yard? And the man said, yeah, sure. That's why I come by. I see if you just sell the stone yard. And so he made a deal with his man. And in half an hour, he hit the place sold for half of what it was worth. But he sold that to Jesus. Brother Oates bought a three-quarter ton truck. Put a set of chimes and a little organ on the back of it. And got a coronet for his boy who played the coronet. And they went out on the street corners of Chicago. And his son played the coronet and brought up a, a crowd. And his wife played the organ. And they would sit around and sing the old hymns. And a crowd would gather. And Brother Oates would get up and best he could he would tell them how to be saved. Then he would get down off the truck and he gave everybody a little mirror. And then he would get back up and say, you want to see a sinner? You want to see a sinner? Everybody would shake their head and said, turn the thing over and it was a mirror. He said, now if you want to know more, go down to the Pacific Garden Mission. I've told you all I know. <laughs> Poor old guy. He gave him what he had, man. Uneducated stone mission. One people to Christ all over Chicago just doing that. Fifth grade education. So you don't have to be college educated. You don't have to be uh, go to Bible school. You don't. You know, all you have to be is submitted to God. Now I'm not telling you to sell your business and go win souls on the back of a truck. That's not what I'm telling you. I'm saying you, as a person, say Jesus, use me. Well, however you can, I, I'm yours. Use me, and let Jesus see see what Jesus will do with you. Win somebody to Christ. Heavenly Father, help us. Now, God, I, I'm not I'm not the best soul winner. I've won a few people to Christ. And God, it's, it's getting harder and harder and harder to win people to Christ in this age. But God, we have less and less people doing it. Help us. Help everyone in the church. Give them a burden for somebody. And God, after they've won that person, give them a burden for another couple people. And God, help them to find these people and, and win them to Christ. Help them to be committed for as long as it takes. Give them the words to say. Give them boldness. Uh, help them to find the scripture method that they can use. God, help them and bless them. Give them souls. Please, Lord. Before you come back and get us, give us some fruit. Help our little church. God, bless us. Help us be the lighthouse we need to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, short sermon, good message, Joe. Go out and do likewise. Make, make, come back and make me wig, amen? Are y'all going to have a pile of money to count today? Yeah, you remember now. It was Stoneman. All right, hallelujah.